all of us love a good prank. Some of us are good at pulling pranks on others. Some of us are just good at making others look good when they pull pranks on us. There's a guy who created the, um, um, the character Sherlock Holmes. His name is Sir Arthur Doyle. He was known to play practical jokes on people around him, especially his closest friends. On one occasion, he sent an identical telegram to 12 of his closest friends. Each of his friends got the exact same telegram. All of it was anonymous. And in the telegram, it said the following words. It said, all has been discovered. Flee at once. Within 24 hours, all 12 men fled the country because they were afraid. It's kind of funny, but the reality is all of us have parts of our lives that we pray that no one would discover, right? All of us have skeletons in our closet. All of us have stuff that we struggle with that we pray that, God, please don't let anyone ever discover it. Maybe this morning there's unconfessed sin in your life that has put you on the run from guilt, your guilty conscience. If so, this morning's message is just for you. There's incredible good news in our text this morning, but there's also bad news here. The bad news is that while you think you can run, the reality is that you can never hide because there's a God who sees and there's a God who knows. This beautiful psalm was written by David after he just discovered just that about God. Everything was going well in his life. He was ruling over the nation. There was peace in the land. And he was at the height of his power. Everything was going well for him. And in 2 Samuel 11, when the nation was going out for battle, David decided that he wasn't going to go out with the army. He was going to stay home. He chose to be somewhere where he wasn't supposed to be. When you're not where God calls you to be, it's the beginning of disaster. And because he was where he wasn't supposed to be, he saw something that he shouldn't have seen. He saw a woman bathing, and he was drawn to the woman. And he went and committed adultery with this woman who was married to another man. This woman becomes pregnant, and now David, to cover his sin, murders her husband. And here's the crazy part. For a while, David thought he could get away with it. For a season, he thought that no one knew, and he acted like everything was normal. For a while, he thought that everything was okay. No one knew about the affair. No one knew that David was the father of an illegitimate, illegitimate child. No one knew that he murdered a man. He thought he got his, hid, his sin hidden. But God knew. And God sent his prophet Nathan and confronted David with this sin. And David's life comes tumbling down. And David realizes that even though no human, human knew his sin, there was a God who was watching over him, a God whose eye was on him. And David, when he was confronted, goes to God and confesses his sins to God. The passage I believe we're studying next week is Psalm 51. It's a beautiful passage about how David confesses his sin. And he says, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. This psalm that we looked at this morning is a sequel to that psalm. Psalms 51 is about confessing. But this psalm is not about confessing your sins at all. This fact, this is a psalm that praises God for a God who forgives us of our sins, a God who is willing to forgive and forget the sins that we have done. The bad news is that you can run, but you can't hide from God. But the good news that the psalmist reminds us is that you can run to God and you can find safety and security in his presence because we serve a God who is willing, ready, and able to give you another chance, a fresh start, and a new beginning in your life. That's the good news for lost sinners that's the good news for us saved sinners, that there's a God who's willing to forgive us. Because we serve a powerful God, our sins can be forgiven. And not just that, because we serve a faithful God, sins can be avoided. That's what the psalmist writes about in our text. Your sins can be forgiven, but beyond that, because you belong to God, because he works in you, because he's faithful to you, you don't have to live in bondage to sin the rest of your life. Sin can be avoided, and that's the entire text this morning. Your sin can be forgiven. There's a story about a father in Spain who had an estranged relationship with his son. Things got so bad that his son eventually ran away from home, wanting to, do not, wanting to have nothing to do with his father. After searching and searching, the father wrote, went to the local newspaper and took an ad out in the paper, and it said, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper tomorrow morning. All is forgiven. I love you. I want you back home. Signed, your father. It said that the next morning there were over 800 teenagers by the name of Paco that came to the newspapers to looking for their father. This morning, maybe you're here, and you've got a guilty conscience that troubles 
to set things right with some family members, with a friend or a loved one. Maybe your heart is guilty. Maybe this morning you've got a guilty conscience that troubles you to set things right with God. Can I tell you that God loves you and no matter what you've done, your sins can be forgiven. Listen to the words of David, a man who commits adultery, who lies, who murders. Listen to these words. Our text begins with a blessing. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. This is the second psalm that begins with a blessing. Psalm 1 that Tara talked about earlier blesses the guy who travels the right path, blesses the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who doesn't sit in the seat of the scoffers. He, um, he talks about a man who walks in the right path, and when he is tempted, he chooses still to do the right thing. The psalmist says there's a blessing for those guys who, when tempted, chooses to follow God. But in this psalm, it says, blessed is the man who goes and follows in a direction and he actually goes the wrong way, but he realizes he's going the wrong way. He turns back and runs to God. Blessed is the man who understands that there's a God who is quick to forgive us of our sins. You're blessed when you choose to live right, but you're also blessed when you mess up and you run back to God instead of trying to hide in your sin. Some of us are destroying our lives because we want to keep our sins hidden And the guilt is driving, is destroying our lives. But the psalmist says, listen, you're blessed when you realize you've messed up and you run back to God and you do a 360 with your lives. Psalms 32 says those kind of people are blessed. Listen, if this isn't a blessing that excites your heart, doesn't excite you this morning, then you don't understand the depravity of your sin. David did. In the first two verses, he uses four specific words to describe a sin. First, he calls his sin transgression, basically a willful rebellion against God. He says, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't care. I'm going to do this anyway because I want to be happy. He knows what he's supposed to do, but he chooses to disobey God. Transgression. Secondly, he calls it a sin in verse 1. Basically, the idea is a sports term. You're shooting an arrow, but you keep shooting and you miss the bullseye. You miss the mark. David says, I want to do what's right, but I keep missing it. I keep falling. Even though I want to serve God, even though I want to honor God, I keep messing up. David says, listen, I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of messing up there. Then he calls it iniquity in verse 2. Sin and transgression are about the things that we do. Iniquity about is our sinful nature. That because we're born in sin, all we want to do is sin. We're prone to follow sinful nature, right? We want to do things that are wrong. We don't have to teach our children. Those of you who are parents know, you don't have to teach your children how to do wrong things. They know how to do wrong things. You got to constantly teach them what to do right. We're prone to follow, fall into sin. He says, David says, I'm guilty of that. My guilt, my sinful nature prones, makes me wander into doing things that are unlike God. And finally, he says, it's a deceit. He says, I thought I could keep this hidden from God. I thought I could hide it. There's a God who watches and he sees me and he knows everything about me. Listen, David was the forerunner for divine judgment. He was the one that should have got it the worst. But what he deserved isn't what he received. Blessed is the one whose transgression has been forgiven. Meaning the unbearable guilt of sin has been removed. His sin was covered, meaning all of its ugliness was hidden under the divine atonement of Jesus. God doesn't count his iniquity against him. So David begins the psalm by saying, listen, blessed is the one whose transgression has been forgiven. Blessed is the one whose sin has been covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Blessed is the one in in whose spirit there is no deceit. Listen, isn't that our testimony this morning? We're not sitting here because we're right. We're sitting here because God, because of Jesus, has covered us in the precious blood of Jesus. Are you really blessed? Have your transgressions been forgiven? Have your sins been covered? Has your iniquity been charged against to the account of Jesus? Can you sing the song of the songwriter, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole. It is nailed to the cross, but I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. That is our testimony as believers. It's not that because we got ourselves right, but it's because our sin has been nailed to the cross and Jesus took our place and he took our sins upon him so we can stand forgiven and cleansed. We, are, we can praise God because of Jesus. David begins this song by standing on the mountaintop and, and, talk, and rejoicing because he's been right, right by God. But in verse 3, he looks down from the mountaintop to where he came from and realizes 
that sin is bondage. Hiding sin is bondage. Look at verse 3. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through the groaning all day long. David's saying that he thought for a while no one knew. He thought for a while he could get away with it, but he refused to be honest with God about it. And so because of that, he suffered physically, he suffered emotionally, he suffered psychologically. There's a huge warning for us this morning. You can think you can hide your sin from everyone, but if you don't deal with the guilt of your sin, the guilt will deal with you. It will affect you. It will destroy you. It will deal with you physically, emotionally, psychologically. Address the sin before it destroys you. The verse describes the reality of being enslaved to sin. Look at verse 4. It speaks of the reason for sin's bondage. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of the summer. They're even saying that the reason I'm suffering is because God's hand was upon me. Because even if no one else knew, God knew. And God wasn't going to let him off the hook. Paul writes in the book of Galatians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that also he shall reap. Let me ask you some tough questions this morning that you've got to answer before God. Could this be the reason why you can't get ahead in life? Could this be the reason why you're struggling and struggling and you're never going anywhere? Is there hidden sin in your life that you're not addressing? Could it be that you're reaping the bitter fruit of wicked seeds that you have planted in your life? Could it be that God's hand is at work against you so that your strength is being sapped from your life day after day because of the, like the heat of the summer day? Listen, there's good news. You don't have to stay in bondage. Look at verse 5. David says, here's the key. I acknowledge my sin to you. And I didn't cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Listen, let this sink into your heart for a moment. Divine forgiveness requires personal confession. Divine forgiveness requires your personal confession. Look, notice the words of the Apostle John. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To say that God is faithful to forgive means that you don't have to wonder if God is going to forgive. He is faithful. If he is faithful, you can go to him and confess. That's what God did for David. God can be trusted to forgive if you confess your sins to him. That's what he will do for you. Listen, God is more anxious to forgive you of your sins then you are to confess it to God. He is waiting for you to come back. He is waiting for you to ask for repentance because he is like the prodigal son's father that's anxiously waiting for you to return home. David begins by saying, God delights to forgive our sins when we confess. But David doesn't stop there. He looks at the reality of his life and he says, listen, sin can be avoided. You don't have to dwell in sin. You don't have to destroy your life in sin. That's the second part of this passage. It says, not only can sin be forgiven, but beyond that, you don't have to live in bondage to sin. There's a lady by the name of Portia Nelson. She wrote an essay called an Autobiography in Five Short Chapters. Here's the essay. Chapter one. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find my way out. Chapter two. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the street. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in. I can't believe I'm in the same place again. It takes me a long time to get out. I find my way out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the street. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It's my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There is a deep hole in the street. I walk around it. Chapter 5, I walk down a different street. Listen, some of you this morning are tired of falling for the same sin over and over and over again. You keep saying, why do I keep falling? Why do I keep falling? And this psalmist says, listen, you don't have to go down that path. You don't have to keep walking down the same street. There is a different path that you can go through. You don't have to keep stop being stuck in bondage. There's a beautiful proverb that Solomon writes that says, can a man carry fire next to his chest and not be burned? Can, can he walk on hot coals, coals and his feet not be scorched? 
the writer is saying, listen, don't be stupid. If you know it's going to burn you, the smartest thing to do is to avoid it. Don't put your hand in the fire and then pray for God's protection. Be smart. Avoid the whole thing altogether. And David says, listen, there's a way you can avoid sin. And he gives us three reasons why, three ways that we can do it. First of all, he says, the number one way you avoid sin is you keep your eyes on God, who is your refuge. You keep your eyes on God, who is your refuge. Verse 6, therefore let everyone who is godly offer a prayer to you at a time when they may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. David looks at all of his failed attempts at life before God, and now he teaches how godly people should respond when they mess up. And he drops a bomb on us. He says a shocking statement. Some might be a shocking to some of you. Godly people mess up. Now, for those of you guys who equate godliness with perfection, that's not what the Bible equates godliness to. Godliness is not that your life is free from sin. Godliness is in your attitude towards sin. Godly people have the same attitude towards sin that God has towards sin. They hate it. They despise it. They want nothing to do with it, even if it shows up in their own life. That's a godly person. But when they mess up, what they do is they run to God. So when godly people sin, they don't live in deceit. They don't play the hypocrite and act like they're okay. They don't try to hide it from God or others. They pray to God while he may be found. Godly people know that there's a time when God may be found, and there's a time when God may not be found. And they don't want to know the time when God may not be found. So they run to God the moment they mess up and they say, God, help, because I want to get out of this mess. So when they sin, they don't waste any time and see if they see, they don't see if they can get a way out of it. They run to God and go to him in prayer. Prophet Isaiah writes, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways. Let the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let them return to God while he may have compassion on him, for he will abundantly pardon. David says, call on God while he may be found. And David promises that God will be a refuge so that the floodwaters will not overtake you. Listen, this doesn't mean that godly people will be exempt from trouble. It does mean that they will be preserved in the midst of trouble. Just because you're godly doesn't mean that trouble will not come against you. It does remind you that there's a God that is with you every step of the way. Verse 7 says, listen, here's why I know this. Because, God, you're my hiding place. God, you preserve me from trouble. God, you surround me with songs of deliverance. Let me ask you, who did David need hiding from? Who did David need protection from? It was God himself. It was, verse 3 says, or verse 4 says, God, your hand was heavy upon me. But now he says that if you pray to God while God may be found, the God of the heavy hand now becomes the God of the helping hand. He will hide you from his own wrath. He will preserve you from trouble. He will surround you with shouts of deliverance. This morning, is God your hiding place? This morning, is he preserving you when you're going through trouble? This morning, did you come this morning with songs of deliverance for him delivering and setting you free? Because because he is holy and just and righteous, all of our sins must be punished. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, we who live on this side of the cross, we know that God's hiding place isn't a location. It's not a place. You don't find safety in a building. You find a hiding place in a person. And his name is Jesus. Because he is our hiding place. And every sin we commit will either be punished in hell or will be pardoned in Christ. You can trust your own goodness this morning and be a deserving victim of the floodwaters of God's wrath and experience God's punishment. Or you can run to the cross and you can admit that there is nothing good in you and you can find a hiding place in the divine nature, the virgin birth, the impeccable life, the atoning death, the glorious resurrection, the heavenly priesthood, and the imminent return of our great and glorious Savior. That's what you could do. In Sunday school, a teacher was teaching her children about how God could see everything. And so trying to make sure her kids understood, she said, is there anything that God can't see? And this little girl raised her hands. Yes, she said, there's one thing that God can't see. And the surprise teacher says, what can't, what can't God see? And the girl said, I know one thing that God can't see. God can't see my sin when it's covered by the blood of Jesus. This little girl had great theology because God counts us as righteous, all of those who are covered by the precious blood of Jesus. That's why the songwriter could say, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunged beneath that flood and they've lost all of their guilty stains. 
David says the first thing you have to do is you've got to keep your eyes on God as your refuge. And in verse 8, he says, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my own eyes. The second thing David says is you've got to look to God for guidance. There is a connection between godly living and guidance. The two are inseparable. In Psalms 139, David says, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The prayer for guidance for David comes after the prayer for godliness. They're connected. Why? Because only when God is your hiding place from the penalty of sin can he lead you away from the presence of sin. Why is that? Look at verse, seven, verse 8 again. Because God's guidance is personal. He says, I will do it. It's a personal thing. He says, I will take responsibility to guide you. Notice what else he says. His guidance is assured to those who find a hiding place in him. He says, I will do it. When God says it, he will do it. He says, his guidance is the wisest that you can get. He says, I will instruct you. Me, myself, I will instruct you. I will teach you. It's the wisest counsel that you can get. He says, his guidance is right. I will guide you in the way that you should go. I'm not going to lead you in some strange path. I will guide you where you should go. I'll lead you in the right direction. And he says, his guidance is unfailing. He says, I will guide you with my eye on you. Pay attention here. It doesn't say... Anything about keeping our eyes on Jesus, the promise in this text is that God will keep his eyes on us. That's what the promise is. God, his eyes, God's eyes are always on us. He doesn't write directions out for you and hope that you get there. He keeps his eyes on you the entire way to make sure you get to where he's called you to be. His eye is on you. But in verse 9, he gives us a warning against sinful rebellion. He says, be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and brittle, or it will not stay near you. David's basically saying, listen, guys, don't be like me. I've messed up. I saw the woman, and I became like an untamed horse galloping toward destruction. He said, then I became a stubborn mule who was kicking and screaming against all, all of God's chances for me to repent on my own. I was an un, uncontrollable horse, and I was a stubborn mule. Don't be like me. And David warns us from his own experience. God knows how to put you in your place. He does. He knows how to humble you. He does. He knows how to break you from your rebellion, even if he has to hurt you to do it. But the good news is that the place that he wants you at is the place that is closest to him. Look at the verse again. He says, don't be like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curved with bit and brittle, or it will not stay near you. It won't stay near God. The bit and brittle are not something meant to get to, for you to do something right or finish a task or go to a certain destination. The goal there is to keep you near. This is where God wants you. Does your life lack a sense of divine guidance? Could it be that you're more focused on possessions or people or property or, something, or a person when all God cares about is getting you as close to him as possible? When God's desire is not to just bless you, bless you, bless you, but God says, get close to me. Seek me first. Fall in love with me. And all of the other details of your life, I will take care. But you need to be close to me. That's what God says here. You need to stop your rebellion. You need to pray like the songwriter prayed, just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, Jesus, let it be. So David says, you got to look to God for your refuge. you got to look to God for guidance. And also, you got to look to God for your source of joy and contentment. Verse 10, David presents us with two ways that we can live our lives. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in God. There are two options. You can live your life in deceit, sin, and rebellion. And the psalmist says that it will lead you into many sorrows. That's the danger of buying into the lies of the devil. It's enjoyable right now but it destroys you later. But he gives us another option. He says, you can trust in God. He says, if you trust in God, you will be surrounded with unfailing love. The King James Version calls it mercy. Another translation calls it loving kindness. The NIV calls it unfailing love. Another one calls it faithful love. The Hebrew word there is the word hesed. It's a covenant love. It's a loyal love. It means that God does not change his mind about you, even if you change your mind about him. 
God is faithful to you. The prophet Jeremiah wrote, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. There's only one way we can respond to the unfailing love of God, and that's how the psalmist responds in verse 11. He says, I will be glad in the Lord. I will rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Listen, this morning, if God has surrounded you with his mercy, you are commanded to rejoice. This can be your only response. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let me close. I want to tell you a story about a pastor and his wife who had two people in his church who were both incredibly sick. And I'm not making this up, but the couple's name was Mr. and Mrs. Doolittle. Mrs. Doolittle was an invalid. She had been confined to her sick bed for over 20 years, never able to get up. Mr. Doolittle was a partially invalid who had to run his family business from a wheelchair. They struggled day in and day out. They often questioned But despite all of their struggles, despite all of their disappointments, despite everything they were going through, this couple was always full of joy. The pastor's wife one day just point out, came and asked them, how can you be full of so much joy? How can you be satisfied despite what you're going through? How can you find contentment despite everything that's going wrong in your life? Mrs. Doolittle responded one day, I picked up the Bible and saw that not even a sparrow will fall without God knowing it. So I told myself, if God watches over the sparrow, I know he's got to be watching over me. The response sunk deep into the pastor's wife's heart and mind. And years later, she sat down and penned the words of the following song. And here's the lyrics. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven? And when Jesus is my portion, My constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he's watching me. Here's how the chorus goes. He says, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. I know he's watching me. This morning, maybe you're here And your life is destroyed because you've got sin that's hidden. The news for you this morning is you don't have to live that way. There is a God who is quick to forgive, to cleanse, and to wash you clean. Your sins can be forgiven, but beyond that, you don't have to live your life destroying your life. By the grace of God, by the power of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit, Your sin can be avoided. He is with you. He is faithful. And the greatest testimony of God's faithfulness that we celebrate week in and week out is that table. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This morning, I'm going to invite you to examine your hearts. Would you examine your actions, your deeds, your attitudes. See if there's anything that's not like Jesus in your life. And would the offer that's been placed in this psalm, would it be applicable for you this morning? Would you run to a God who is willing, able, and powerful enough to forgive you? Would you run to him? Would you ask him for forgiveness? Would you let him cover and remove your guilt? Would you let him cover your sins this morning? As you examine your hearts, I'm going to invite you, whenever you feel that God is calling you, whenever you've prayed and you feel like you're ready, I'm going to invite you to come and grab the elements from the table. The way that we do communion here is we let you pray, we let you meditate, and when you are ready, you are allowed to come and grab the elements. So when you are ready, will you come and grab the elements and um, open them up and you can sit at your chair and I'll come back and we'll partake of the table together. But this morning, let me remind you, you don't have to live destroying your life. There's a God who is faithful to you even when you were unfaithful. He is faithful. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will put you on a new path. You can trust him because he never fails. Father, this morning as we examine our hearts, would you challenge us? Would you change us? 
If there's anything in our lives that is not like you, would you remove it? Would you help us to run to Jesus? Would you help us to run to the one who saved us, who redeemed us? May our hope, our trust, our confidence not be in what we do, but let it be in whose we are. May we be daily reminded that we belong to Jesus. We love you. It's in Jesus' name.